part two chapter ten of bessie's fortune by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain ten gray between the man of twenty-three and the boy of fourteen who had knelt upon the snow in the leafless woods and asked god to forgive him for his grandfather's sin and had pledged himself to undo as far as was possible the wrong to others that sin had caused there was the difference of nine years of growth and culture and experience and knowledge of the world but otherwise the boy and the man were the same for as the grey of fourteen had been frank and truthful and generous and wholly unselfish with a gentleness in his nature like that of a tender loving woman so was the grey of twenty-three whom we last saw upon the steamer which was taking him away from home and the lonely woman watching so tearfully upon the wharf and feeling that with his going her joyless life was made more desolate since that time there had been a year's travel upon the continent with his parents and then he had entered at eton where he renewed his acquaintance with neil macpherson between whom and himself there sprung up a friendship which nothing had weakened as yet several times he had been a guest in neil's home where lady jane treated him with the utmost civility and admitted that for an american he really was refined and gentlemanly he knew jack trevelyan and blanche and all neil's intimate friends and had the entree to the same society with them wherever he chose to avail himself of it which was not very often he was in europe for study he said and not for society and he devoted himself to his books with an energy and will which put him at the head of his class in eton and won him an enviable reputation for scholarship at oxford where he had now been for nearly four years and where he intended to remain until his aunt lucy and possibly his aunt hannah crossed the sea and joined him for an extended tour then he was going home for good to settle down and marry he said for in all gray's dreams of the future there was always the picture of a happy home with some fair sweet-faced girl in it reigning equally as mistress with the dear aunt hannah still living her solitary life in the old farmhouse and keeping watch over that hidden grave under the bedroom floor and laying up year by year the interest on the gold which was one day to go to the heirs of elizabeth rogers of carnarvon if they could be found but could they that was the question both she and gray asked themselves as the years went on and no trace was discovered of any such person either in or around carnarvon for gray had been there more than once and with all due precaution had inquired of everybody for the woman elizabeth rogers and finally as he grew a little bolder for joel rogers himself who went to america many years before but all to no avail both joel and elizabeth were myths and the case was getting hopeless still gray did not despair and resolved that during the holidays he would go again to the old welsh town and try what he could do and so it came about that he accompanied neil as far as carnarvon where he proposed to spend a day and then go over to stoneley on christmas eve more to please neil who had urged him so strongly to stop there than for any particular satisfaction it would be to him to pass the day with strangers who might or might not care to see him he knew there was a cousin bessie a girl of wondrous beauty if neil was to be believed and he remembered to have heard of her years ago when he was a boy and first met neil macpherson at melrose faint memories too he had of hearing her talked about at the memorable thanksgiving dinner which had preceded his grandfather's death and his own sickness when they said he had asked miss macpherson to send for her and stuff her with mince pie as a recompense for the many times she had gone hungry to bed because there was not enough money to buy dinner for three and all this came back to him as he stood in the station in carnarvon waiting for the train she must be a young lady now seventeen or eighteen years old he thought and neil says she is beautiful but i dare say she is like most english girls with a giggle and a drawl and a supreme contempt for anything outside the united kingdom i fancy too she is tall and thin with sharp elbows and big feet like many of her sisters i wonder what she will think of me people say i am more english than american which i don't like for if there is a loyal son of uncle sam in this world i am he i can't help this confounded foreign accent which i have picked up from being over here so long and i do not know as i wish to help it perhaps it will help me with miss bessie as well as my english cut generally and gray glanced at himself in the dingy little glass to see how he did look what he saw was a broad-shouldered finely formed young man who stood so erect that he seemed taller than he really was a face which strangers would trust without a moment's hesitancy large dark blue eyes thick brown hair just inclined to curl at the ends 
and a smile which would have made the plainest face handsome and which was gray's chief point of attraction if we accept his voice which though rich and full was very sweet and expressive of the genuine interest and sympathy he felt for every human being in distress or otherwise no tired discouraged mother in a railway car trying to hush her crying infant would ever fear that he would be annoyed or wish her and her child in jericho on the contrary she would if necessary ask him to hold her baby for a moment and the child would go to him unhesitatingly so great was the mesmeric power he exercised over his fellow-creatures this influence or power was inborn and he could no more have helped it than he could have helped his heartbeats but added to this was a constant effort on his part to make those with whom he came in contact happy to sympathize with them in their griefs to help them in their needs to sacrifice his own feelings to their pleasure for in this way he felt that he was in part atoning for the wrong done by the poor old man dead long ago and forgotten by nearly all who had known him such was the grey gerald whom neil macpherson met at the menai station and escorted along the road to stoneleigh i should have driven out for you only there is no carriage i think i told you that mr archie macpherson is awfully poor he explained apologetically as he saw gray pull his fur cap over his ears for the wind was blowing a gale and drifting the snow in their faces i do not think you ever told me in so many words that they were very poor but i had an impression that they were not rich gray said adding i prefer to walk and rather enjoy battling with a northwester it takes me back to new england the very land of snows and storms they were in the park by this time nearing the house when suddenly the curtains of a window parted letting out a flood of light into the darkness and gray saw for an instant pressed against the pane a face which made his heart throb quickly with a kind of glad surprise as if it were a face he had seen before while with it came a thought of his aunt hannah and the lonely old house in the pasture land in far-off allington a moment later and the face was looking up to his with a half fearful curious expression which was however changed to one of great gladness as bessie met his winning smile and the kind eyes bent so searchingly upon her she had no fear or dread of him now and she gave him her hand most cordially and bade him welcome to stoneley with a warmth which made him feel at home and put him at his ease perhaps you would like to go to your room at once and neil will show you the way she said to him then in an aside to neil my room you know at the head of the stairs neil looked at her in surprise while a cloud gathered upon his brow that bessie should give her room to gray seemed to him absurd though he never stopped to ask himself where she could put him if not there neil knew perfectly well the capabilities of the old stone house and that spare rooms were not as plenty as blackberries but so long as he was not incommoded it was no business of his to inquire into matters nor could he understand that an extra fire even for a day was a heavy drain on bessie's purse but gray's quick ear caught bessie's whispered words and before he entered the warm pretty room at the head of the stairs he knew it belonged to her and guessed why she had given it to him under any circumstances he would have known by certain unmistakable signs that it was a young girl's apartment into which he was ushered and after neil left him he looked about him with a kind of awe at the chintz-covered furniture the white curtains at the window and the pretty little toilet table with its hanging glass in the centre and its coverings of pink and white muslin just then through the door which had inadvertently been left a little ajar he caught the sound of voices in the hall below neil's voice and bessie's and neil was saying to her disapprovingly why did you give your room to gray was it necessary yes neil there was no other comfortable place for him the north room is so large and the chimney smoke so we could never get it warm bessie said and neil continued and so you are to sleep there and catch your death cold not a bit of it bessie replied dorothy will warm the bed with her big warming pan and i shall not mind it in the least i am never cold well i think it's a shame neil said feeling more annoyed that gray was to sleep in bessie's room than that bessie was to pass the night in the great cheerless north chamber with only old dorothy's warming-pan for comfort but it never occurred to him that he could give gray his room and himself take the cold and the dreariness of the north room nor yet that he could share his bed with gray he never thought for others when the thinking conflicted with himself and returning to the dining-room he sat down by the fire with anything but a happy expression on his face and he wished that he had not invited gray to stoneleigh 
something in the expression of bessie's and gray's faces as they looked at each other had disturbed him for he had read undisguised admiration in the one and confidence and trust in the other and knew that there were already sympathy and accord between them and that they were sure to be fast friends at least just as he had told himself he wished them to be meanwhile gray was thinking as he made his toilet for supper and as a result of his thoughts he at last rang the bell which brought old dorothy to him my good woman he said flashing upon her the smile which always won those on whom it fell and drawing her inside the door which he shut cautiously my good woman i do not wish to be particular or troublesome but really i should like a room without a fire the colder the better one to the north will suit me if there is such a one no matter for the furniture a bed and washstand are all i require you see i have so much health and superfluous heat that i like to be cool and then i have the he stopped short here for he could not deviate from the truth so far as to say he actually had the asthma so he added in an undertone if i had the asthma i could not breathe you know in this small room pretty as it is and upon my word it is lovely have you no larger chamber which i can take yes dorothy said slowly with a throb of joy as she reflected that her young mistress might not be deprived of her comfortable quarters after all there is a big chamber to the north cold enough for anybody but miss bessie got this ready for you she will not like you to change do you have the tea-sick very bad gray did not answer this question but began to gather up his brushes and his combs and putting them into his valise he said i want that north room take me there please and say nothing to your mistress dorothy knew this last was impossible she should be obliged to tell bessie but she did not oppose the young man whose manner was so masterful and whom she led to the great cheerless room with its smoky chimney down which the winter wind was roaring with a dismal sound while across the hearth a huge rat ran as they entered it tis a sorry place and you'll be very cold but i'll warm your bed and give you plenty of blankets and hot water in the morning dorothy said as she hastily gathered up the few articles belonging to bessie who had transferred them from her room to this i shall sleep like a top gray replied much better than by the fire this suits me perfectly and the cold is nothing to what america can do he was very reassuring and wholly deceived by his manner dorothy departed and left him to himself phew he said as a gust of wind stronger than usual struck the windows and puffed down the chimney almost knocking over the fireboard this is a clipper and no mistake and what an old stable of a room it is and what a place for that dainty little bessie to be in she would be frozen solid before morning i guess i shall sleep in my overcoat and boots what a lovely face she has and how it reminds me of somebody i don't know whom unless it is aunt hannah whose face i seem to see right side by side with bessie they must be awfully poor and i wish i had brought her something better for a christmas present than this gimcrack and opening his valise he took out a pretty little inlaid work-box fitted up with all the necessary appliances even to a gold thimble remembering the christmas at home when a present was as much a part of that day as his breakfast gray had bought the box in london as a gift to bessie and when he caught a glimpse as he did of the worn basket with its spools and scissors and coloured yarns for darning which dorothy gathered up among other articles belonging to bessie he was glad he had made the choice he did but now as he surveyed the apartment and felt how very poor his host and the daughter must be he wished that he could give them something better than this fanciful box which could neither feed nor keep them warm as he had finished his toilet in bessie's room there was nothing now for him to do except to give an extra twist to his cravat run his fingers through his brown hair and then he was ready for the dining-room where he found bessie alone as a matter of course dorothy had gone to bessie and told her of the exchange which delighted her far more than it did her mistress mr gerald in that cold dreary room bessie exclaimed oh dorothy why did you allow it and what must he think of us i could not help myself darling for he would have his way dorothy replied he was that set on the cold room that you couldn't move him a jot his breathing apparatus is out of killer he has the tie sick awful and can't breathe in a warm room i shall give him some cubebs to smoke to-morrow and don't you worry he won't freeze i'll put a bag of hot water in the bed he is a very nice young gentleman if he is an american bessie knew she could not help herself 
but there was a troubled look on her face when gray came in and approaching her as she stood by the fire made some casual remark about the unusual severity of the weather for the season yes it is very cold she said adding quickly as she looked up at him oh mr gerald dorothy has told me and i am so sorry you do not know how cold that north chamber is and we cannot warm it if we try the chimney smokes so badly you will be so uncomfortable there you might let the fire go down in in the other room if the heat affects you dorothy says you suffer greatly with asthma yes no gray replied confusedly scarcely willing to commit himself again to the asthma i shall not mind the cold at all i am accustomed to it you must remember i come from the land of ice and snow you have no idea what blizzards america is capable of getting up and ought to hear how the wind can howl and the snow drift about an old farmhouse in a rocky pasture land which i would give much to see to-night there was a tone of regret in his rich musical voice and forgetting that neil had said he was from boston bessie said to him is that farmhouse your home oh no my home proper is in boston he answered her but i have spent some of my happiest days in that house and the memory of it and the dear woman who lives there is the sweetest of my life and the saddest too he added slowly for right in bessie's blue eyes looking at him so steadily he seemed to see the hidden grave and for a moment all the old bitter shame and humiliation which had once weighed him down so heavily and which naturally the lapse of years had tended to lighten came back to him in the presence of this young girl who seemed so inextricably mixed up with everything pertaining to his past it was like some new place which we sometimes come suddenly upon with a strange feeling that we have seen it before though when we cannot tell so bessie impressed gray as a part of the tragedy enacted in the old new england house many many years ago and covered up so long he almost felt that she had been there with him and that now she was standing by the hidden grave and stretching her hand to him across it with an offer of help and sympathy and so strong was this impression that he actually lifted his right hand an instant to take it in the slender one resting on the mantel as bessie talked to him what would she say if she knew he thought feeling that it would be easy to tell her about it feeling that she was one to trust even unto death bessie was interested in gray and already felt the wonderful mesmeric influence he exercised over all who came in contact with him in the salons of fashion in the halls of eton and oxford in the railway car or in the privacy of domestic life gray's presence was an all-pervading power or as an old woman whom he had once befriended expressed it he was like a great warm stove in a cold room and bessie felt the warmth and was glad he was there and said to him i wish you would tell me about the house among the rocks and the woman who lives there i am sure i would like her and i know so little of america or the american people you are almost the first i have ever seen before gray could answer her neil came in and as supper was soon after served no further allusion was made to america until the table was cleared away and the party of four were sitting around the fire archie in his accustomed corner with bessie at his side her hand on the arm of his chair and her head occasionally resting lovingly against his shoulder neil was opposite while gray sat before the fire with now and then a shiver running down his back as the rising wind crept into the room even through the thick curtains which draped the rattling windows behind him but gray did not care for the cold his thoughts were across the sea in the house among the rocks and he was wondering if his aunt hannah was alone that christmas eve and was thinking just how dark and ghostly and cold was the interior of that bedroom whose door was seldom opened and where no one had ever been since his grandfather's death except his aunt hannah and himself as if divining his thoughts bessie said to him i wish you would tell us about that house among the rocks is it very old yes one of the oldest in allington gray replied and instantly archie roused from his usual apathetic state and repeated allington did you say allington in massachusetts yes gray replied allington in massachusetts about forty miles or so from boston do you know the place my aunt lives there the woman for whom bessie was named miss betsy macpherson do you know her yes i used to know her well when i was so often in allington before my grandfather died gray replied and neil said to him what manner of a woman is she something of a shrew i fancy 
i saw her once when i was a boy and she boxed my ears because i called her old bet buttermilk and she said that i and all the english were fools because i asked her if there were any wild cats in the woods behind her house served you right gray said laughingly and then continued she is rather eccentric i believe but highly respected in town my aunt lucy is very fond of her did you ever see her and he turned to bessie who replied i saw her once at aberystwith when i was a child and she afterwards sent me this turquoise ring the only bit of jewellery i own and bessie held to the light her hand on which shone the ring daisy had unwillingly given up to her on the occasion of her last visit to stoneleigh for a long time they sat before the fire talking of america and the places gray had visited in europe and it was rather late when the party finally retired for the night neil going to his warm comfortable room facing the south and gray to his cheerless one facing the north with only the cold and the damp and the rats for his companions if we accept the bag of hot water he found in his bed on which dorothy had put woollen sheets and which she had warmed thoroughly with her big warming-pan this is not very jolly but i am glad i am here instead of bessie gray thought and undressing himself more quickly than he had ever undressed before he plunged into the bed which was really warm and comfortable and was soon wrapped in the deep sleep which comes to perfect health and a good conscience End of chapter ten